on asymmetrical warfare is going to be facilitated by Dr. Ed Barrett, who has been mentioned a number of times uh, yesterday and today, the Director of Strategy and Research at the Stockdale Center, also a uh, selected colonel in the Air Force Reserve, combat experience, and someone who's made a great impact here at the Academy and outside of the walls. So, Ed, I'll let you uh, tackle Thank you, sir. the panel. My combat is experience is that I've been shot at <laughs> as a C-130 pilot in uh, Iraq. So thank you very much for that. Um, before going on, I just wanted to thank uh, everybody, and especially the uh, speakers and panelists. It was very easy to organize this with such enthusiastic and, and generous people, so thank you all. And I also want to apologize for uh, not talking to you that much. Somebody mentioned yesterday, this is like a wedding, being a groom at a wedding. You invite all your favorite people into town, and then you talk to them all for about 30 seconds. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a little frustrating, but uh, uh, I'm very happy and thankful. So uh, t on to our topic, the, uh, the issue of asymmetric wars, obviously uh, occasioned by new scenarios, and most specifically, new types of adversaries and new types of activities by these adversaries. So now we have non-state actors in, in relatively weak states, which brings up the issue of targeted killing as a, a possible means for dealing with this. Uh, we have adversaries using guerrilla tactics, which uh, occasions the issue of interrogation. We can't find them. How do we find them? We interrogate them. How far do you go? And then uh, the issue of just dirty tactics uh, on the part of some of these guerrillas uh, slash terrorists at times. Uh, using civilians in many different ways, and in the Kantian sense, uh, bringing up the issue of non-combatant immunity. What, what is our response to that kind of activity, which we discussed yesterday, uh, especially in Professor Walter's excellent speech. So we will treat all of those issues, uh, first uh, with Michael Gross on non-combatant immunity, and then Mike Skirker, interrogation, torture, and uh, um, due process, I think more, more generally he's going to talk about and then the issue of targeted killing with David Wetham. So first up is Michael Gross. Uh, Michael is professor of political science and chair of the Division of International Relations at the University of Haifa. He has published widely on military ethics, medical ethics, and military medical ethics, and on related questions of medicine and national security. His articles have appeared in the American Journal of Bioethics, the Journal of Military Ethics, and the Journal of Applied Philosophy, as well as other places. His books include Ethics and Activism, Cambridge, Bioethics and Armed Conflict, MIT Press, and most recently, Moral Dilemmas of Modern War, Torture, Assassination, and Blackmail in an Age of Asymmetric Conflict. And basically, this panel is based on that book, motivated by that book, informed by it. And we couldn't treat all the issues raised mm -hmm. in it, so we decided on three. Uh, he has been a visiting fellow at the University of Chicago and has led workshops on battlefield ethics, medicine, and national security for the Dutch Ministry of Defense, the U.S. Army Medical Department at Walter Reed, and the Medical Corps National Security College of the Israeli Defense Forces. So thank you for being here, Michael, and take it away. Well, thank, you <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you not only for the invitation to the conference, but also for inviting me here for two weeks. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege, mm -hmm. and we're not only the conference, we have some workshops set up. It's been very, not only enjoyable, but also very stimulating for me, and I've uh, enjoyed it immensely, and I hope to be here next week if you don't close up the Naval Academy. Uh, I want to talk today about a case. I want to present a case. I was uh, working on doing a workshop a month or so ago for officers in the Israeli Army, and two questions were posed uh, during this workshop. Uh, one of them, the first one is the question we've been kicking around here yesterday and part of the day, does a soldier have an obligation to risk his life to save the life of enemy combatants? And the second question was posed by a military physician who asked me, does a physician or medic have an obligation to risk his life to save the life of a wounded enemy soldier? The second question is a teaser. I'm not going to talk about it today. But if you come on Wednesday to the fellows, <laughs> fellows uh, workshop, uh, I'm going to talk about this and some related issues. So the case that they presented us with, point it there, was similar to the one that we also kicked around yesterday. Uh, might pertain to Gaza, might pertain to Afghanistan, where missiles are launched from a building housing many civilians. Warnings are issued for civilians to evacuate. The attacks continue, but few civilians leave. 
should the attackers bomb the building or advance on the ground under fire. Now, to work this problem through, I think you have to look at three different things. You have to look at the rights of the people involved, you have to look at the question of risk, and you have to consider the issue of warnings. Now, on the question of rights, what I sometimes find it useful to do is to map out the different rights of the participants. So on the right hand, oh, wrong way. On the right hand side here, we have two different <coughs> kinds of participants. We have non-combatants, of course, who are entitled to the right not to be harmed directly, unnecessarily, or disproportionately. And we have combatants, and they have rights too, not as extensive as those of non-combatants, who have the right not to endure unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury. These are claim rights, so that different agents, specifically here, the enemy army and the government, have certain duties towards those two groups of individuals. The enemy army has a duty not to harm non-combatants directly, unnecessarily, and disproportionately. And the government has an obligation, both to its civilians and to other non-combatants, but basically to its own civilians, to provide protection, military protection, and a duty to preserve the fighting force, and to provide civil defense for its own civilians. Now, combatants also have claim rights against the same two, the same two uh, groups. They have claim rights against the enemy army, not to employ prohibited weapons and torture and so forth, and they have claim rights against their own governments. They expect the government to provide leadership, supplies, medical care, and not to engage in unnecessary wars and so forth. So that you've got a range of conflicting rights here that are going to have to be sorted out in this problem in order to decide under what conditions it's permissible to attack and what conditions it's not permissible to attack and what conditions it's permissible to bomb and so forth. You've got rights of non-combatants not to be harmed unnecessarily. You've got a range of combatant rights not to, be harm, not to harm civilians unnecessarily. Uh, they have a duty to take moderate risk in war, and they have a right not to be harmed unnecessarily by their state. The state, in turn, has a series of duties, of course, to preserve its fighting force, to protect its own civilians, and to wage necessary wars. So the problem in the example that we gave is that you've got a conflict here between the duties of the state to protect its soldiers and not to unnecessarily risk their lives and the duty of combatants, employees, or agents of the same state to protect the lives of enemy non-combatants. What you don't have here, and what I think what's important to see, is that there are no duties that non-combatants have, at least in this scenario. Non-combatants have no duty to undertake risk for the benefit of combatants. They're the ones who are going to be protected. So. The rights, issues is com the rights issue is complicated, but I think you can still begin to sort it out and try to then apply it in the different scenarios, and I'll do that in just a moment. But first I want to say something about, about risk and the question of risk. Uh, we said today and we, we, yesterday as well that soldiers, combatants, have a duty to undertake moderate risk. We have also noticed that it's very, very difficult to define what moderate risk is. Uh, we know that it's variable. Uh, that it's going to change commensurate with circumstance and it's going to change commensurate with the weightiness of a military mission. The more weighty, the more important it is, the more risk that soldiers may be expected to undertake. We know it's not supposed to be suicidal. We also know it should be unaffected by combatant identity. In other words, it should be the same whether the com the, uh, by non-combatant identity. It should be the same whether the non-combatants in question are enemy combatants or our own combatants. Now, there's a caveat here because you're going to have a situation, I think, where as soldiers, they're go soldiers are going to assume a certain amount of risk to protect combatants, whether they're own combatants, uh, excuse me, they're going to assume a certain amount of risk to protect non-combatants, whether they're their own non-combatants or enemy non-combatants. But it's also very likely that a soldier would assume more risk for his own compatriots. So there's going to be a minimal level of risk that combatants have to assume for their own non-combatants. And there may be more risk that they're willing to assume for their, own, for their own friends and family. Now, the fact that a combatant is willing to assume more risk for his compatriots doesn't obligate him to assume the same level of risk for enemy non-combatants. So there's going to be, at a professional level, there's going to be a minimal amount of risk or a certain amount of risk they much, must, must uh, undertake. At another level, as being friends, family, compatriots, there might be more risk 
that they're willing to undertake. But the important question for us to focus on then to try to, to, try to uh, give some meaning to the word of what is moderate risk is to look at what are the professional obligations, self-imposed professional obligations of a soldier in the military. And we can do this in two ways. One way is to do it relatively. We can say, well, what are the relative risks that a soldier takes compared to other professions? Well, we know that a soldier generally takes more risk than a police officer, more risk than a physician, and more risk than a stranger would take. Well, that doesn't tell us anything about how much risk, but it does give us some kind of vantage point about how to judge it. The other way to do it is to turn to the profession itself and ask them, and I think we started to talk about this a little bit yesterday, to undertake this mission themselves, this kind of discourse themselves. Now, there's a precedent for it. In the bioethics literature, physicians talked about this in the 90s when they asked themselves, how much risk should a physician undertake to treat an AIDS patient? This is the early 1990s. There was no cure for AIDS. And there was extensive documentation and extensive discussion within the profession about how much risk a physician should take. And the way of discourse was through case studies, very casistic, very case study oriented, but a, certain boundaries emerged from this discussion about what was professional risk, what was necessary risk, and what was beyond the call of duty. And the idea of beyond the call of duty is another way we can look at what is the moderate or reasonable risk that soldiers should assume. There's a great body of literature in the United States and every other country about soldiers who go above and beyond the call of duty. Heroism. Now, this doesn't tell us what exactly moderate risk is, but it does give us an idea of where the limits are. So if someone would undertake an, al an analysis of the kinds of instances that prompted a citation for heroism, then I think this kind of uh, textual analysis would start to yield certain parameters about what is reasonable risk and what is supererogatory risk. And I actually did that a little bit at one point. And what I realized was that uh, there's two things involved. There's an element of risk, so it's usually higher risk, but it's not higher risk alone. There's also a question of the distribution of risk. So if an entire unit is asked to undertake a mission at very high risk, they may not be regarded as heroes. But if several people are singled out and asked to undertake a relatively <coughs> high risk, in other words, the distribution of risk is not equal but very focused, then those are the kind of situations where you would ask for volunteers. So again, this isn't, this isn't exact, but rather than just say we don't know exactly what moderate risk is, I think enterprising students, enterprising philosophers can start to think about this by looking at or demanding from the profession how they want to work this through and then looking at what's been done historically. Now, if you combine these two together, the idea of risk and the idea of, um, of rights, you can look at the different scenarios that I painted here and start to come to some conclusions. Well, this is broken down into two categories, right? Uh, if the bombing is proportionate and necessary, and if a frontal attack is less than or more than moderate risk. So if a bombing run is disproportionate, and the risk of a frontal attack exceeds what we would normally expect of soldiers, then the plan of attack is to desist. If a bombing attack is proportionate and necessary, then there's ethical grounds and legal grounds to bomb. The question that get more, gets more interesting is what if a bombing attack is proportionate but not necessary? People sometimes forget about this category. So you could easily have a situation where there's another avenue of attack that is feasible <coughs> even though bombing may be proportionate. And if risk is moderate, then I think a frontal attack would then be indicated rather than a bombing attack. Alternatively, if a bombing was proportionate but not necessary, in other words, you had another avenue of attack, but it involved high risk to, to, um, to soldiers, then bombing would then be indicated. Now, the problem with this, of course, is in the details. What is proportionate and what is moderate risk? And here I have to say that what we're doing here, military ethics, legal and, and, and military law, is very much like quantum physics in the sense that 